Not so long ago, this here was a thriving trade route. Then the blight came. The people left. And just like that, it was deserted. Making it the perfect little shortcut. Gab's waiting for us up ahead. Come on. Still feeling sorry for yourself? Don't. Please, think about it, Clive. The rumours all point to... That was an Imperial signal. They shouldn't be here. The old fort's been abandoned for years. Our little chat can wait. I need to see what the bastards are up to. You go on ahead and meet up with Gav. But we both know that... No buts about it. Clive is at his lowest moment right now. He believes that he has killed his brother and he wants to die himself, but he's being convinced to continue to push on, at the very least, to see what Gab has to say. But he's still, he doesn't understand the value of doing this. He's just carrying on, I don't know, kind of an autopilot here. Now, I would say that perhaps Sid has some conception of what's happening here, that the person we're searching for is actually Joshua. He just didn't get a chance to say it because of that um, that horn being blown from the Imperials had distracted them for a moment. So, we're separated again from Sid, and now Clive has to go on in his own, and... I don't know, he, maybe he's not in a position that he really should be left on his own, because he is kind of fucked up in the head. <laughs> but you know, uh, desperate times call for stupid measures, so here we are. Let him go with his dog and see if he doesn't just jump off a cliff. Something that the game, in a weird way, I can't tell how open this world is supposed to be because there are plenty of instances well, I mean I hold on there are plenty of instances earlier on with like the side quests where you have free run of the hideout, and then you accept the side quest, and you head out into the different areas of the map, fast traveling to them and all that, in order to in order to uh, get there. Now, it, it's not like a true open world in the sense of like a Skyrim, or even an open world in the sense of like Final Fantasy 15, where they have a large contiguous map that you were gated through certain forms of progression, but you really could just, especially after the map has been unlocked and all that, you could just point yourself in a direction and just cross from one side of the map to the other. This one loads in separate areas and then you advance through it, sort of like Final Fantasy XII. Now in a way, I kind of prefer that because it gives you the impression that the world is larger because like, you know, the uh, biomes and all that can change and like oh well it doesn't feel like you're just running for 15 minutes because you hit a loading screen and you move into the next area well that could be the next day of travel you know what I'm what I haven't put together yet though is how much of the game will allow you to or require you to go back to previous areas that you'd already been in 
is it just you progress through linear level after linear level and it just so happens to be that these linear levels are connected to each other and then you could um, go back upon yourself or where you've already been retracing your steps in order to access side content? Or is it going to be that the game itself requires you, like in a mandatory way, to go back to these areas or discover new secrets or something like that? Now, 12, Final Fantasy 12, did this. They had you go back during the hunts and all that stuff. Also, the environments sort of branched off of each other. Like, you go left, you head to this map. You go right, you head to this map. You go straight, you head to a third map. And they're all interconnected like that, which gave a greater level of freedom, or feeling of freedom, as opposed to what I seem to have been seeing so far in this game, where everything is just sort of one environment connected to the next, connected to the next, connected to the next. Is there any real branching? That, I'm not deep enough into the game to be able to tell. It's still feels like we might be early in this game. Another perfect little shortcut, Sid. Straight to a nest of bloodthirsty beasts. That is something to make note of there. That a lot of these corridors that we're taking to go from one environment to the next do not seem to be, you know, normal roads. These are definitely back channels or back uh, back roads, alternative ways of getting to places because you're trying not to be seen. The tattoo on Clive's face alone will get him into some trouble if he's discovered. So you gotta hide a little bit. Which means we're going to be into these more off-the-beaten-path environments, encountering more monsters, all that kind of stuff. That's something I do wonder. Like, as the game progresses, will we have the option of taking the normal roads everywhere, or is it always going to be these back roads? I don't know. Just all speculation. Uh... It does kind of give you, or give me anyway, a little bit of a feeling of how narrow these corridors can be. Of kind of claustrophobic feeling I'm getting from Final Fantasy XIII. Which famously just put you in narrow corridors. Well, clearly that's not the case in a lot of these maps. Like the one after we fought Benedicta in the tower and we got tossed out. It was a fairly large environment. You can run left, you can run right. There was really only one proper way through, but it was a larger environment that you could get through. You could explore a little bit, find secrets, fight some extra enemies, that kind of thing. In this case, we're on a narrow path, but they do, in a sense, give a nice feeling of it being a larger environment by having sort of a longer view distance. Like, I can see stuff off into the distance. Things that are clearly detailed and look nice and stuff, even if you stare at them for a while. Which, Final Fantasy XIII didn't do as much. Like, there was only so much uh, memory on the PlayStation 3. So, like, you put all of your rendering and um, texture budget and all that kind of stuff into the environment you can traverse. And the stuff that's far away, you give it a low resolution, low detail, all that kind of thing. And then skyboxes and all that kind of stuff. But the games itself were still, like, high enough resolution that you could just look at these environments that are off in the distance and notice, like, oh yeah, that's low detail there. It makes you feel like you're running through a movie set, in a way. Oh yeah, that, uh, that street down there is just painted on the wall, you know, just don't pay too much attention to it. This, with the power of the PlayStation 5 now, with its gobs of memory, fast solid-state storage, higher uh, polygon budget, everything. The stuff that's further away, 
not just a higher resolution skybox, which does exist, but the objects that are outside of your reach that are really just set decoration and are far away look detailed enough, look high enough detail to make it feel like the world you're in continues out there. Like that waterfall over there, we're not going to reach that waterfall. But it's animated well enough and high enough detail, high enough resolution and everything to make it feel like it's part of the same world, even if technically it's just that set decoration. So, you know, that's not just a artistic sense, but also one of technological progression. You couldn't do that so much in with the PlayStation 3 or the 360. The PS4, you had... Um, with Final Fantasy XV, it being a more open-world environment, a lot more of the stuff that you could see, you could actually get to. So that argument doesn't have as much merit or much relevance in that case. And there haven't really been that many mainline Final Fantasy games in the past 20 years. So there's not too many things that I could bring up in that series in regards to this argument. So that's why I keep bringing up those three titles. 12 was a PlayStation 2 game. <laughs> PlayStation 2 had even less memory and less detail that I can put into the set decoration environments. But um, everything, it tends to populate the areas in the distance with more skyboxes and environmental maps, that kind of stuff, rather than like rendering out objects and that kind of stuff. So I guess it worked better, especially with like the lower resolution of the video uh, output and that kind of stuff. You know, that's the end of that argument. So we finally caught up with Gav. Well, sort of. Gav ran off again. But, you know, he's in some trouble. <laughs> Motivating live to action. And this is the kind of thing that he's going to need to keep himself going. One thing after another. The Clive, what's the situation? You're late. Gav's in trouble. What? The Imperials are on his tail. We have to get to him before they do. Understood. I'm here to even the odds. Any objections? I'll take the dragon. You take the dragoon. There's some people that need to kind of commit themselves to work in order to get through the problems. Because if they stop and think about it, they realize how miserable they are. That's not projection or anything. Uh, <laughs> Clive kind of wants to die at this point in the game. But if there is something in front of him to motivate him to keep going, then he will keep going. In this case, like, well, as it, it, depressed as he is and all that kind of stuff, there's a fight in front of him, there's a cab he has to save, that's a problem in front of him, and he'll keep going as long as he has something that he needs to keep himself motivated with. 
you'd think there would be something about him, of his life, that he may want to latch on to otherwise in order to um, motivate himself to keep living life. Well, he hasn't, he hasn't talked to her yet, but, I mean, he did just rescue Jill, and to some extent, he has come back into his life as somebody that he had a close relationship with when they were children. But, you know, she's unconscious, and he hasn't, he hasn't spoken to her yet, so that's, of course, not going to do him any good yet. Eh, well... It's, it's a kind of weird that the best thing that he could find to continue living is there's people that need to get killed. <laughs> and he's got he's got to go stabby-stabby on a dragoon. <laughs> Sid is really powerful here. You see him just not even really using his sword so much. He is just casting his lightning power all over the damn place. You'd think that this guy, who I'm guessing is a bearer, Regardless of how skilled or how powerful he is, he wouldn't stand a chance against a dominant. I mean, that was kind of the whole point of the whole uh, Benedicta losing her mind when we beat her in a fight. It doesn't seem like any of these bearers should be powerful enough to fight a dominant. But this guy, you know, he's putting up a pretty damn good fight. He's actually fighting two dominants right now. One of them's clearly way more focused on using his magic powers. Clive is stabby stabby, and his spells that he's firing off, like the lightning or the air, the fire, whatever coming out of his hands, are not particularly powerful. Although he does have those special abilities, but they look like they're not particularly impressive compared to what the dragoon can do, where he jumps down and then does like the lancet attack. But anyway, it's, this is just gameplay. I mean, you, there's always going to be a distinction that you have. To you have to allow some sort of dissonance between gameplay and then the overall story. Because, I mean, in a realistic sense, every sword slash that's not blocked is going to potentially result in a person's death or a debilitating injury. Doesn't make any sense from a narrative or storytelling distance to have a person be so invincible that they can take blows like that and continue to live practically unimpeded. But from a storytelling perspective, like if you see someone getting slashed with a sword and he cuts go. Must go down. If you see a person getting slashed in a cut scene, you're going to be more willing to accept that that was a potentially fatal or at least a significant blow. There was a really obvious example of this in the game Final Fantasy X, where you and your party ascend up a kind of like a flight of stairs in an attempt to stop Yuna's wedding to Seymour. And during this, you get into a lot of battles where you are shot over and over again by soldiers holding rifles. But then the cutscene plays, and then they hold you hold you up and hold you at bay by pointing guns at you. Hey, I got shot a bunch of times running up here. What significance is this? But, you know, that's a little bit of an overly obvious example of it, and it does, like create a little bit of an issue in my head there, but you know, it's just the kind of thing that we accept as gamers. Come on.
Clive doesn't have your nose, I said. He'd stumble off a cliff, I said. Well, that's a trouble with a nose like mine. Can't help sticking it where it's not wanted. But if it wasn't for you two, my sniffing days would be over. Thank you. Truly. So, what news? Well, I uh, found out where your friend's heading, for one thing. Gav. I... Him and his mate are on their way to your old stomping ground, Rosaria. You should have seen what they did to the Imperials who tried to stop them. There's no question about it. He's a dominant fire, all right. He can't be. Clive, I saw you turn into an icon before my very eyes. And yes, there's a good chance it was you who killed the Phoenix. But we weren't alone, were we? There was the fellow you saw enter the whirlwind. I... I saw him too. You didn't dream it, Clive. He's out there. But... who is he? Don't ask me. I don't bloody know. But I do know one thing. You're gonna find him and find out. After all, you swore an oath. What? You swore you'd avenge your brother's death. That you'd never rest until you'd hunted down the man responsible. So? Find out if this man's responsible, and kill yourself if he's not. Sid, I... Don't thank me. Thank Gav. <laughs> thank you, Gav. Yeah, well, yeah. Well. <laughs> no birds returning this year. The deadlands have swallowed their roosts, like as not. We're running out of time. We'll be in Rosaria in a day or two. Back to where it all began. He must be stopped. <laughs>